folks, my first guest tonight is an investigative journalist who won a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting on Harvey Weinstein. His new book about the corruption and cover-ups he encountered during that investigation is called Catch and Kill. Please welcome back to The Late Show, Ronan Farrow. Nice to see you again. Thanks for having me. Uh, let me a quick question about the Pulitzer Prize. I, I love a question about the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah. <laughs> I got a lot of prizes. I don't have one of those. Are they nice? Are uh, they nice? It, it helps to fill the yawning void of insecurity that I'm constantly trying to fill. Oh, good. Yeah. Good, 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 good. I got one of those, too. Uh, the new book, Catch and Kill, which digs into your reporting on Harvey Weinstein and the circumstances around it. Um, how long ago uh, did your original article come out? Because we are, before that, while, you know, hashtag MeToo existed, and certainly uh, there was an awareness of uh, uh, sexual abuse happening in the workplace or sexual harassment happening in the workplace, it, uh, it, 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 it amplified, it certainly accelerated, broadened the people's knowledge of this and sort of created a new cultural era for us. What was the, when did that actually come out, that article? It's been almost exactly two years. Mm -hmm. And you're right, there was incredible grassroots activism. Tarana Burke coined the term. Yes. Wonderful community organizing, still does. Uh, but it has been incredibly moving to see in industry after industry people standing up and saying enough and starting to talk about some of the systems that kept this quiet for so long. Okay, so let's talk about those systems. Because that's what's fascinating to me is that while we, we've known a lot about um, some of the rev revelations about powerful men who were not held to account, let's talk about the ways in which they were protected. What is catch and kill. That's an old term, isn't it? It is a tabloid journalism term. Uh, I use the term journalism very use loosely. I a lot of outlets, including the National Enquirer, used to acquire uh, the rights to a story in order to not publish it, but bury it at the behest of a powerful person. That's so a protective buy, where you just take it and you just you That's make right. it go away. And it is used in this plot both literally in the sense that I'm following a trail of clues from the National Enquirer mm -hmm. working to smear victims of Harvey Weinstein and bury stories for him all the way up to the top, if you will, to the collaboration between President Trump and the National Enquirer. And it's also used figuratively, Stephen, because it is about these broader patterns in our profession, in the media world, that have kept these stories buried. Okay, I'm not sure if we have the same profession, but thank you very much. <laughs> now, um, I, co I consider you a tough journalist, and you make a cameo in Catch and Kill. I did, I did, I did see on page 401, just randomly. He did not read this book. He went I, straight to the in index. He went straight to his name. I, I, go, I go straight to the, just to the filet of the neighborhood. It's the and important now, part. Now, on CBS, Stephen Colbert looked at me narrowly. Right? And said, I didn't want the story to, be, and I said, I didn't want the story to be about me and change the subject, because I was asking about NBC not running the story originally. And uh, I said, Colbert said, part of this story is the story not being told for so long and you experiencing the story not being told. First of all, this Colbert character seems pretty sharp. He's pretty and... sharp. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good moment. I'm surprised it took you to page 401 to get him in there. We'll see about moving it up in the exactly. reprints. Exactly, okay. Now, um, but let's talk about that. You, what, what, what was the status of this story before you took it to The New Yorker? Where were you with NBC on this story? So there's been much discussion of this. The fact is, and it's laid out very clearly in the book, we had what I considered to be an explosively reportable uh, body of evidence. Uh, we had passed standards and legal reviews of various kinds. We had a tape of Harvey Weinstein admitting to a sexual assault, multiple women named in every draft of the story. But that actually is a distraction from the main point, Stephen, which is what you were asking about and I was dodging questions about was that my producer and I at NBC were ordered again and again to stop. It was not, you don't have enough, get more. It was, don't take this interview, cancel this interview with a rape victim, don't take a single call on this, stand down. Now, why didn't, why. You, why didn't you tell me that story at the time? Would it have taken you 401 pages to tell <laughs> the answer to that? Well, part of the answer is yes. You know, the, running through the book is this struggle about whether to speak about this. And we have all in our profession in the last few years dealt with this struggle of what do you do when these allegations hit your own house? What do you do when it's so close to home? So in other words, the people who were protecting Harvey Weinstein, in your opinion, in that moment, were the people at NBC News. Right. So there was a shutdown of the story. You had cottoned on to that. A lot of people had cottoned on to that. And yet it is very hard 
to speak truth to power when it's your own bosses. I did a lot of reporting on CBS, and you were among the first to be really principled and get on TV and say, he's my boss, but he has to be held accountable. That's a tough thing to do. And I won't make you blush by talking about that. We can just move on from that, but I admired it. We are seeing the same thing happen around NBC now. People like Chris Hayes getting on air and saying, you know, this needs to be a subject where tough questions are asked, and the killing of this story was wrong. And I was in the same position, Stephen, where I was struggling with, I don't want to be the story. I'm the reporter. I've spent a year living in the traumatic allegations these women made, the brave thing they did. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I wanted was to burn all my professional bridges and make the story about me. But as more and more sources came forward and talked about a culture of cover-ups and a pattern of secret settlements to bury this kind of stuff, I realized it was a story I had to tell, and it would take 400 plus pages to do it. Here's how I know that we're not in the same profession, is that I love being the story. <laughs> uh, you touched on this a moment ago. We've been talking a lot about Trump and, and, and quid pro quo mm -hmm. lately. Um, explain the relationship that Donald Trump had with the National Enquirer, which is owned by AMI, which is American Media... Incorporated. Incorporated, okay. How, what was the quid pro quo between AMI and Trump. What were they getting? I know what Trump was getting, which is to get his butt covered, and uh, it takes a fair amount of paper. And <laughs> what was AMI getting out of this? So I follow a trail of clues in this book from Harvey Weinstein working with AMI to Trump working with AMI. And I reported a number of stories along with a lot of other great outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, about this practice of catch and kill, and the fact that during the 2016 election, uh, Trump associates worked closely with the National Enquirer to suppress, for instance, various stories about affairs. There was a doorman at Trump Tower who claimed to have a story about a Trump love child. Not clear if the underlying story is accurate, but these transactions where they were paying people to bury the truth or even bury a rumor were news, and they were potential violations of election law. And ultimately, after I got lied to a lot in this book, Stephen. Okay. Just lied to and lied to and lied to. And AMI says, no, we didn't publish this stuff because it just didn't meet our exacting journalistic standards. <laughs> uh, but ultimately then they signed a deal with prosecutors saying, uh, just kidding, we did all of this. And you know, the book reveals a couple of new instances of that, including a collaboration to go after a story involving Trump and Epstein. Well, there was, what was the story between Trump and Epstein? So there was a, an anonymous lawsuit filed by a, an unnamed Jane Doe alleging that when she was underage there was a sexual assault involving Trump and Epstein and human trafficking. And look, this, like that doorman story I just mentioned, is a case where it's not clear that the underlying allegation is true. Mm -hmm. the, the source proved to be elusive. No reporter has ever really checked it out. But there was an effort we reveal for the first time where there were close conversations between the Trump camp and AMI, and they sent a reporter out to try to get that story. And all of this becomes important because, as you say, it is a quid pro quo, and on Trump's end, you wind up with various stories suppressed that could have a material effect on our politics. Do you and know on how AMI's many stories? End. So I actually see, for the first time any journalist has seen it in this book, a master list of all the historical dirt that Trump uh, that was about Trump in the AMI archives. How many stories? Ballpark it. It's a, it's a list called, you know, something about killed stories about Donald Trump, and it's about 60, and they're... Well, I should say, the headline here is not that there's some explosive unknown headline. Like so many of these things, the story is the cover-up. The underlying content of the list is it's about five affairs. There's one allegation of misconduct, which is the Jill Harth case, which has become public. Um, so really, the story here is that they made this list, uh, that they were working with Trump, and that right before the election, they actually shred a bunch of stuff on it. There is a shredding party. But they still know that these stories existed, and as you were saying, they have that over the President of the United States. Right, so there's a couple of ways that the power flows in this relationship. One is uh, David Pecker, the head of the National Enquirer, mm -hmm. uh, gets various perks, you know, and it's everything from the banal invitations to inaugural events and flying on Trump's plane and so forth to dinner at the White House and introductions to wealthy Saudi interests that could maybe revive the ailing National Enquirer. And on Trump's end, you get maybe a material distortion of the election. That's why this matters so much. These are about patterns that keep the truth away from the public. That matters for our democracy. Well, we have to take a little bit of a break, but when we come back, uh, I'll ask Ronan about some of the crazy stuff that happened to him when he was reporting these stories. Ronan Farrow, everybody. Stick around.